blessings, good evening and uh, welcome back to our live stream which uh, many of you have been asking about. We disappeared off the airwaves from a, for a number of days because of the storms and we lost power, we lost our internet signal uh, but we've restored that not quite as good as before but almost as good as before. So we'll carry on because it's our lockdown program. While people are unable to visit the monastery, then we try and give you some guidance, instruction and encouragement in your practice, leading you in meditation, chanting. And tonight is Tuesday, so it means a Q&A session. And there are a few questions have been sent in, so we'll try our best to give you some answers and uh, encourage you to carry on practicing the Dhamma, contemplating the Dhamma. So, um, first question. Is emotion part of our kilesas? Thank you, Ajahn. Well, um, as we know, we talk about a lot, the Buddha talked about a human being as comprising the five khandhas, five groups that make up our experience and, and what we have as human beings. So Rupa khandha is form, physical form, Vaitana khandha, feeling, sanya kanda, perception, sankara kanda, mental formations, vinyana kanda, sense consciousness. So the five kandas are what we're working with, our raw material, and kalesas are mental defilements, mental afflictions, sometimes called negative emotions. Um, they come up within the khandhas, so within the Sankara khandha, the mental formations can be negative or coming from kilesa. Kilesa are all rooted in greed, anger, delusion, uh, but manifest in you know, different ways. You can have different kinds of greed, attachment. Um, you can have uh, lust, say sexual desire, lust, you can have desire for sense pleasures, attachment to even just to subtle feelings of bliss and so on. Uh, kalesa can come in in many forms and anger can be very mild irritation or it can be r rage, you know, ready to murder someone or destroy something. And delusion can be just basic dullness, confusion, or it can be very subtle delusion of self that attaches to even the most refined states of mind. So there's plenty of kalesas around and they manifest uh, in the mental formations, but they're accompanied by, say, different uh, perceptions, triggered often by sense consciousness, <coughs> may manifest in our body as well, physiologically, if, uh, the body can uh, reflect the state of mind and changes happen in the body, hormones come out, chemical changes, muscles change according to your mental state and so on. So all the five candors are supportive of the mind of kilesa or the mind that is opposite of kilesa, that's the mind of the path, the Eightfold Noble Path, which is for abandoning Kilesa. So there's no exact translation of the word emotion, but basically the mental formations, the Sankara Kanda is where emotion is sort of represented, you might say, and that can be positive or negative, but it's always accompanied by Vaitana and Sanya, so that's a part of emotion, isn't it? the way we perceive things, the feeling that comes with that particular mental state. So when you're angry, you have a painful feeling. 
subtle or coarse. Uh, if you have a positive emotion, maybe the emotion of satha, faith, or you have a pleasant feeling, or you have the positive emotion of metta, goodwill, you have a pleasant feeling. So all the candors are affected by the state of mind, whether it's wholesome or unwholesome, uh, whether it's kalesa or the wholesome dhammas that are make up the factors of the path leading to the ultimate abandoning of kilesa. So emotions fit into that in the Buddhist way of describing things. So you can have positive emotions which are part of the path. So like metta, karuna, kindness, compassion, satta, faith. Mindfulness, you probably wouldn't call it an emotion but it's a positive mental state that counters delusion and confusion. Um, you have the practice of samadhi, which has many factors combining to make the mind that is still, peaceful, calm. Uh, so you'd call that you know, a positive emotion. What does samadhi do when we practice samadhi, develop samadhi, develop the continuous uh, practice of mindfulness, the mind will merge into samadhi and that's accompanied by sukhavetana, so it's pleasant, enjoyable, piti, rapturous, uh, ekakata, one-pointedness. So, you know, the way the Buddha taught, he taught us to practice on different levels, on the level of body, speech, mind, or sila, samadhi, panya, so sila is help, the practice of sila, undertaking precepts, becoming mindful of our speech and our actions. We use the practice of sila, moral integrity, ethical conduct, to counter the worst excesses of the kilesas, to restrain our negative emotions that might lead us to hurt others physically, verbally, to steal from others commit acts of sexual misconduct and so on. So the practice of sila restrains the worst of our negative emotions or the worst of the kilesas. But the kilesas are still there um, and you'll see when you practice sila you might be angry with someone but you're mindful enough, determined enough not to verbally abuse them or display your anger in your speech but it's still there as a mental state. So the more subtle emo negative emotion of anger is something you have to work with and deal with through meditation, developing mindfulness, clarity, wise reflection, and ultimately seeing it as impermanent, unsatisfactory or suffering and not self. So we're working on many levels to deal with kilesa and developing the positive emotions to counter the negative emotions is part of that practice. So bringing up metta when you have anger. Um, when you practice and develop faith, that helps support the practice of letting go on certain levels, doesn't it? Letting go of doubt, letting go of confusion and agitation. Also with faith, um, that tends to lead on to the practice of restraint, keeping precepts. So that develops a certain positivity of mind. You know, keeping precepts, you have that quality of uh, the mind is free from regret, free from guilt, which would be negative emotions, kilesas. You have a happiness of keeping sila, uh, which supports the practice and particularly supports the development of meditation, mindfulness and samadhi. Um, developing right view as the path also supports the arising of positive emotions like gratitude and appreciation for the good that oneself has done, that other people have done. And that has a very nourishing quality in the mind. So you know, you're, when you're becoming more aware, more sensitive to yourself, to others, and you, grat gratitude arises, you know, you're grateful for the the help people have given you, even people you might not initially think you like or connect with, but if they've helped you and done good things, your mind is opening up to that and gratitude will arise. 
So positive emotion and developing positive emotion in Buddhism is a very much part of the path. Um, and this helps us to reduce the power of negative emotions, undermine them, reduce them from, from our experience. But ultimately we're developing that insight that sees all emotions as impermanent, as not self. All aspects of the khanda, five khandas, impermanent, not self. Dear Ajahn, when practicing insight meditation, when a fearful or unpleasant thought arises, then the feeling arises. Should one start to chase or follow the feeling, or try to be equanimous with it? Um, yeah, meditation and training this mind Using words like to chase or follow sounds a bit dodgy. <laughs> um, our aim is to try and develop mindfulness, clear comprehension, um, and the ability to wisely reflect on our experience. And mindfulness, having mindfulness, the presence of mindfulness allows you to reflect wisely and see the true nature of what your mind is contacting or experiencing. So I wouldn't suggest to chase or follow feelings, um, I try to be mindful, aware of the feelings. So that implies a certain stillness, steadiness of mind, that centeredness of mind. As you establish mindfulness, you can know what is arising in your experience, but without chasing or following it or getting entangled with it, without um, stimulating a lot of mental proliferation, endless thinking that is not guided by mindfulness and wisdom. When you establish mindfulness, it helps you to pay attention in the present moment so that you can examine the truth of your experience. So if you have many moments of mindfulness, as we are cultivating, particularly in meditation, uh, but at any time we can cultivate mindfulness, of course, Many moments of mindfulness will allow us to really examine and see the nature of our experiences. So if you, um, if you have an unpleasant thought arise, as you establish mindfulness, you recognize that, the unpleasant qualities of that thought. It's accompanied maybe, maybe by a negative feeling, unpleasant feeling. Then the details, the perceptions that are arising with those, that thinking, you see them. But with mindfulness, maybe you have enough clarity to see that you know this is a a train of thought and a train of perception that is tricking you, and you you may have enough wisdom to say, well, don't believe it. It's a creation of the mind. You know, the reality that we think we know in life is tends to be a reality based on what we think about things. So you know, the reality is I like this and I don't like that and our thoughts reflect that. But you know, the things of this world and the experiences of, that we have are just what they are. But then our mind, through a lack of mindfulness and wisdom, adds on and creates perceptions. So, so with fearful thoughts, you know, that's, we've created that fear by um, focusing on either a, an image in our mind that we've created, so often it's imagination, or maybe a past event we remember and then attach to that perception. So you know, like with a place, uh, as I'm always mentioning in the forest, if you meet a poisonous snake in the forest, you tend to remember that spot where you met the snake maybe for many days in the, in the future, carrying on from there. The perception lingers, oh, that's where the snake lives, that's where the snake was. And sometimes even just reaching that spot, fear arises based on the memory and then the negative thought and the unpleasant feeling, even though there's nothing there. <laughs> and we do that all the time, especially with fear and anxiety. We worry, we are anxious about something that may or may not happen in the future about a person, ourselves, some aspect of our experience, our life. And if we're not well trained, we tend to grasp at the feeling and then the negative, negative thoughts and the perceptions that come up. And like you say, we chase them, we follow them, and they delude us, they trick us. 
when you establish mindfulness, you can consider things more carefully because you've got that steadiness. The more mindfulness is there, you can know your experience, even when it's unpleasant. But your mind doesn't race with it or grasp hold of it or push it away either. Mindfulness allows you to have some steadiness, some equanimity, and then you can learn from your experience and see the, the nature of what it is that you're involved with. And it may just be seeing, oh, that's just a thought, you know, a fearful thought. It's just a fearful thought. And when you're mindful, you can see the thought arising and you know, oh, don't believe that, don't follow that, and you let it go. So mindfulness and wisdom leads to equanimity and this quality of upeka, but you know, how well we maintain our equanimity depends on the maturity of our practice because of course there will always be something that will knock you off, off balance, off center, a new experience that prompts or triggers anger or desire in one way or another, fear or doubt. Uh, so that's where we're practicing, to improve our level of mindfulness and to reflect wisely and develop that ability to see the true nature of experience rather than let it push our mind around all the time. You know, getting caught into desire and grasping for things we want, things we like, becoming fearful or angry with things we don't like or don't want. You know, learning to establish mindfulness, it's a it's our whole practice, isn't it? And then reflecting on the Dhamma, reflecting on the truth, this will bring the mind to experience more equanimity. Is having attained a certain level of jhana a prerequisite to go deeper into insight meditation? Yes. <laughs> um, you know, Samar Samadhi is consisting of the four Rupa Jhanas, first, second, third, fourth level of Jhana. And there are different benefits from developing deeper states of Samadhi, the power and the refinement and the continuity of mindfulness is improving all the time. The 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 happiness of the mind is improving. <coughs> the depth of the samadhi, the stillness of the mind is improving with each uh, level of jhana. So the purest kind of mindfulness is synonymous with fourth jhana, where the mind is purified by the continuous presence of mindfulness and equanimity. And so they say the best uh, conditions for developing insight into the three universal characteristics of existence, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, or the selfless nature of phenomena, is when you withdraw from fourth jhana into upajara samadhi, and where you can contemplate and see and understand the nature of this body as impermanent, not self, you see it the most clearly coming out of fourth jhana, so that's the best. But it doesn't mean to say you can't develop insight at any point in your practice. So if you're a total beginner with just a tiny bit of mindfulness, fine, you just carry on and practice with that and keep working on it. So one way we like to talk about it is you know, when you have a little bit of samadhi, uh, it's like you're walking into this dark room, say like last week, there was no power, so there's darkness everywhere. And you're walking into a dark room and you want to know what's in there. So if you have a little bit of samadhi, it's like you have a cigarette lighter and you can just flick it on for a few moments. And you can see a little bit in that room, maybe just enough to get around, but it's not very efficient. And it's not very good way to walk around a dark, darkened room because your light is very limited and doesn't, doesn't last very long. But if you light a candle, say a small candle from your cigarette lighter, then maybe you can walk around that room a little bit more easily and you, you'll see a lot more and maybe the flame is there for a while, but if it's a small candle, maybe it's easily blown out or you know it only highlights certain features of whatever's in that room, the furniture or whatever else is in there. So then you maybe get a bigger candle 
and like that and so you can see more or maybe somebody with fourth jhana you know, it's like they walk in and they've got this big searchlight you know, like those searchlights you get from Bunnings that just highlight everything every last detail of the room what's in it is exposed, revealed by the searchlight so samadhi is like that it's giving you the steadiness of the mind so that wisdom can function better and see more clearly the nature of phenomena on every level the coarse, the refined um, so it's better but that doesn't mean to say you can't develop insight we're just a cigarette lighter you know? a lot of the time we're just working with a cigarette lighter and we just have to accept that a cigarette lighter still shows you something. You can still see a thought is impermanent and go, oh, there's another thought. That's, in, that's insight into impermanence. You may not have deep jhana, but you're seeing impermanence when you notice a thought arise, pass away. A feeling arise, pass away. Um, you know, do your vipassana when, at any time. So say nowadays everybody's getting the vaccine for the COVID. So you go and get your vaccine practice vipassana so the needle comes up to your arm then it goes into the arm as a little prick and then it withdraws and just mindfully watch a painful feeling arise pass away that's vipassana you know you don't need jhana to do that you can just observe that and that's already developing some insight but of course the deeper your Samadhi, the stronger your mindfulness, the clearer the insight will be. Dear Lumpur, in the Majjhima Nikaya, chapter 123, it's the Sutra on the Wonderful and Marvelous, a section of paragraph 20 is quoted as follows. As soon as the Bodhisattva was born, he stood firmly with his feet on the ground, then he took seven steps north, and with a wide white parasol held over him, he surveyed each quarter and uttered the words of the leader of the herd, I am the highest in the world, I am the best in the world. What is Lumpur's view over these, this statement? As during the the time our Lord Buddha had not yet attained enlightenment yet. What is my view? My view is I wasn't there. So I'm not fully qualified to say exactly what happened or why. But I do trust in the ten perfections, the Bharamis of the Bodhisattva who was uh, born as Bodhisattva, Siddhartha, the little prince. You know, he's developed the ten barometers to the completion of, of to their completion over many, many lifetimes. I don't have much doubt about that. So I believe that the Buddha you know, or the Bodhisattva, sorry, at birth, you know, he's ready for what's to come and this is his last life so that was another comment I don't think you mentioned that but the, he ended that line you know, I'm the highest in the world I'm the best in the world this is my last life you know if you've been practicing for that long for so many lifetimes and you've already been confirmed by a previous Buddha uh, Tipankara Buddha has already said you will become a Buddha of this name in, in this future date it's already been confirmed. So not only do you have your own strong determination, your own wisdom faculty is well developed, you also have the confirmation of a living Buddha. So even though he's not yet a Buddha, he's already a very special being. And there's also the fact that he's maintained mindfulness through the, the birth process, we believe. You know, that's somebody who's got very good mindfulness, even as a baby, having been born, their mindfulness doesn't get lost. So it's possible. My feeling is, yeah, it's possible. A, a bodhisattva in his last life, soon to become a Buddha, maybe can walk some steps and make these comments. Because he knows. Because it's got you know, the, the wisdom barami, the sabadi, the abhinya, all the qualities needed to see his own jitta 
and know, you know this jitta is ripe for the Dhamma and compared with anyone else around, it's the, the best, it's the leading jitta, the leading, um, the most developed jitta. He could have that insight, I would say. So it doesn't surprise me, I don't, you know, I, it wasn't there, so I don't know for sure, but I, I think it's possible that this could be said. And it's not wrong that the, the bodhisattva, who's not yet a Buddha, just has that intuition, I will become a Buddha in this life. And then there are many other times during his time prior to becoming the Buddha, right up to the very last day when he was sitting under the Bodhi tree. You know, there were many intuitions to say, this is what I'm here for, this is my uh, goal, and uh, I have what's needed to reach it. Uh, you know, great confidence, determination, and many other qualities were there. And I, I would have thought that the Bodhisattva, even at birth, could, could be aware of that. So that's my view. <laughs> Something I tell people sometimes when I was once on staying in the jungle in Thailand, southern Thailand, some hunters came by who had come down from the mountains where the, there was deep jungle with very few people living, but people may wander through that jungle, but they don't live there. And even though they were hunters, they're still Buddhist and they had faith in monks, they came and had a chat and they said, on one of their trips, they had found this amazing part of the forest, virgin forest with just animals, no people anywhere around that area. And there were these large lotuses on the ground. They weren't in water, they're on the ground. These big ones, you get these giant lotuses, like down the road from the monastery here, there's a lotus farm. You can see these huge lotuses and they have a picture of a baby sitting on one. So they're obviously big enough to hold a baby. And this hunter was saying, he came across this very sort of uh, heaven-like area in the forest, in the jungle, where there are all these huge lotus leaves there and his first thought when he saw this picture was, now I understand it could have been true that when the Buddha was born or the Bodhisattva was born and these seven lotuses were there for him to step on, he just had this feeling it could be true because he saw these lotuses. Obviously the Bodhisattva wasn't there, but it was just that sense, mm, it's possible. So he was telling me, he was very kind of inspired and full of faith telling that story. I encouraged him to give up hunting, but I'm not sure if I succeeded. I never met him again, but I remember his story of meeting these lotus leaves and believing this could, this could be you know, the kind of place where a Buddha steps or a Bodhisattva steps after being born. The last question. What is the difference between letting go and upeka? Um, well, upeka is this quality, we say equanimity, keeping the mind in the middle towards conditions. So it's one of the Brahma Viharas, so it's, it's a meditation object in itself, developing the meditation on equanimity. It's also uh, a quality that comes with wisdom as well. And the Buddha said, you develop equanimity by reflecting on karma, the law of karma, that all beings are the owners of their karma, receive the fruits of their karma. And that's just a law of nature that you can't change. Of course, we can affect our karma, we can make good or bad karma, we have that choice all the time. But once a karmic act has been made, you can't stop that from fruiting. The only way you can stop karma from giving its fruit is be reaching Nibbāna and then that's the end of the whole thing. But until that point, once a, a mental intention has come up, that already is mental karma and if it's put into speech or action then that's verbal or physical karma and it will give its result. It's like planting a seed and that seed will, when the conditions are ripe, will manifest. 
So developing that reflection that all beings are the owners of their karma brings equanimity because even if someone you love or are close to is suffering, you can't deny the fact that they're receiving the fruits of their karma, even if it's very unpleasant and it's not what you want. It's just the truth of the way things are. Good and bad karma gives its result. So that's one way we develop equanimity, reflecting on uh, karma and developing it as a mental state in samadhi. And then, of course, you get the natural equanimity arising when you practice mindfulness. Mindfulness is the main factor of equanimity. So the more mindfulness we develop, the more equanimity we experience. Um, and so if we talk about you know, the seven factors of enlightenment, practice of mindfulness, investigation of the Dhamma, developing energy, tranquility, samadhi, and then equanimity. It's, it's both the result of the practice, but it's also a quality we are developing and cultivating and being with during the practice as well. So it's both the result and, and the mechanism as well. It's the method as well, developing more and more equanimity. So how do you develop it? Well, one way, you might say, is through letting go. You know, this is a term Lumpo Cha used a lot. Um, it's a kind of catch-all for letting go. What does it mean? Well, it means letting go of the causes of suffering, you might say. Letting things be putting equanimity into practice, so rather than grasping at, or reacting to your experience, you're developing equanimity towards your experience. Um, so equanimity towards the things you desire, seeing that they are impermanent and not self, brings up equanimity, so then desire starts to fade. Um, equanimity towards suffering and its causes. So say you have an unpleasant experience coming up in life, you know, painful health condition you know, brings you some pain, developing equanimity towards it through establishing mindfulness, reflecting on it as impermanent, not self. Patience also supports the arising of equanimity and a lot of letting go is practice of patience, isn't it? Just being patient with an unpleasant situation, unpleasant feeling, or patient with the behavior of other people that may be as hurtful to us or somehow disadvantaging us. There's many factors that support the arising of equanimity and we could say all of this is letting go, letting go of kilesa, letting go of attachment to self, whether it's very coarse or very refined, letting go of unskillful ways of body, speech and mind leads to equanimity and is carried out by developing equanimity. So letting go is both you know, practicing equanimity and leads to equanimity. And there's so much we are letting go of, but ultimately we're letting go of attachment to this, these five candors, this body and mind, with the view of it being a self. We say self-view or self-identity view. So what, when you feel peaceful, when you have enough mindfulness and you're able to contemplate and see some and understand some aspect of the Dhamma, being peaceful, what does that mean? Well, it means you've let go of your confusion, your agitation, whatever it was that you may have been holding on to or was blocking your mind. And the peace is equanimity of one kind or another. It may not be yet be the equanimity of a, an enlightened one, but it's equanimity that is uh, gradually maturing in your practice. So your mind gets more used to being equanimous towards conditions the more you practice. So then you're more familiar with your equanimity the more you let go. So they support each other. Um, example, uh, the Buddha talking about how to deal with the criticism or the hateful words of people who are angry with you. And this isn't constructive criticism, it's just people who are against you. They abuse you, they're saying things to hurt you. 
you practice equanimity like the earth. You know, the earth, whatever you throw on the earth, beautiful or ugly, nice smelling, foul smelling, beautiful things, rubbish, the earth stays still, equanimous. So we're making our mind more like the earth as we experience the conditions of the world, so say the words of other people. You still have to hear the words, you know the meaning, but you're trying to keep your mind in the middle towards that um, experience. And, and that is letting go, isn't it? Letting go of your anger, letting go of your sense of self, letting go of the hurt pride, the feeling of hurt. We may let go on the level of sila, so you, you have the thought, oh, I want to say something back to them because they're being so rude to me, but you let go and so you achieve equanimity. Or it may be a more subtle kind of letting go on the inside, just a few subtle movements of mind, you know, they, they uh, uh, verbally abuse you and there's a sort of eh in the mind. You don't say anything, you don't feel much, it's just a little movement, eh. Why are they saying that? But you let go of that and you achieve equanimity. So we achieve equanimity on many levels. Um, but letting go leads to equanimity and supports it and is part of it. You know, in the end it's the one mind, so these qualities are actually working together. So that's the end of tonight's questions. Um, I hope our signal has been strong, the signal of the internet so that you can see and receive this live stream. And we hope the signal of the Dhamma is strong, that you are getting the message from the Buddha that you know, the way out of suffering is developing sila samadhi panya, developing virtuous behavior, mindful behavior, cultivating skillful qualities of mind and abandoning kalesa. That's the other signal that you're getting tonight. We hope you get that one just as strongly as you get the internet signal. So uh, I will leave it there and uh, wish you all well until next time and we'll just finish the meeting with uh, paying respects to the Triple Gem. <laughs>